Thank you very much, Mario, for inviting me and thank you very much for your interest uh, in the German model. Um, when you talk about uh, co-determination from a German uh, perspective, you have to keep distinct and apart two very, very different um, points where co-determination attaches. So you really have to think about the two-column approach where, for example, on the left-hand side you have the topic of um, supervising the strategic issues of the board, which is co-determination <coughs> on the what we call strategic enterprise level set out in a dual model, which I'll explain in a minute. And on the other hand, if you're so like on the column on the right-hand side, you would have to think about of a co-determination procedure that is done by works councils at the various level of the works level, of the enterprise level, or on the group level, but not focused on strategic decisions of the board, and in the supervisory committee, but focus on the day-to-day -day operative questions of running an enterprise and where employee rights and obligations are at stake. So in order to give you a complete picture, first a couple of remarks of the co-determination in the strategic questions. I think this is a rather unique model that in a dual system where you have a supervisory board and an executive board, you have starting from really medium-sized enterprises of more than 500 persons, you have a supervisory board comprised of one-third of employee representative and two-thirds of shareholder representatives. And in enterprises of 2,000 and more employees, you have a split board, 50% of employee representatives and 50% of shareholder representatives. In the financial sector, and this is of course what we are talking about today, most of the enterprises that are run in cooperative settings, therefore, have a 50-50 board. And, um, only when it comes to a split decision, the chairman of the supervisory board, who is elected by the shareholders, has a second vote. But this is, a, this is the legal setting in which this occurs. In reality, there are no such things as split decisions, because usually the board unanimously decides. That's just the practical way of how it is handled. But in the supervisory board, it is important to understand that uh, the German system has chosen a way to include employees and in this setting also has defined union seats, two of them, where unions that are not in the enterprise or has no representation in the enterprise can send people to the board and do so. And this is a distinction to the works council model, which we will discuss in a second. So on the supervisory board level, you have guaranteed seats for unions. And this means that all the strategic decisions that the enterprise makes, they are not co-determined in the sense of co-determination, but really determined by employees as well. This, of course, brings more responsibility to the employee side, because all the decisions that then have an effect on employment works councils will talk about and what we will talk about later, have gone through the supervisory board before. <coughs> of course, at the outset, 30 years ago, the supervisory board was merely a supervisory authority. But in the way of modern corporate governance, the supervisory board is becoming more and more a co-decision maker together with the executive board in strategic decision making. And what does this mean? This means that the economy of management on the one hand and workers on the other hand 
in those kinds of enterprises do not exist because the operative decisions that we will talk about in a minute are approved or even co-made by a supervisory board that is comprised by 50% not only of shareholder representatives, but also of workers. So this is important to understand because, of course, from the strategic level, this then boils down to what is the more operative level where works councils come in. And from the German um, way of um, dividing between the systems, they are really divided and distinct from one another. So they are, there is not a real, if you saw, like Chinese wall where this cannot spill over to one or the other side. But these are the supervisory board and the company, they are liable to the shareholders. There's also, with respect to the personal liability of the decision makers, there's no difference between workers and capital. So they all have the same rep uh, responsibilities, and this is why it is not a committee where you decide on votes, but it is a committee where you decide on agreement. And in the practical way of how it is handled. This is important to understand. Now, from this decision-making in the supervisory board, there's a totally distinct model uh, of works councils. And these works councils, they can be elected in any companies, <coughs> private or incorporated companies, whereas, of course, the, the co-determination is only existing in corporate models, where people spend their own money. You cannot have co-determination, so this is limited to corporate settings of incorporated companies, and banks are those kinds of uh, companies all the time. But on the works council level, it's a different, totally different issue. All enterprises with five or more employees can vote for a works council. They don't have to. And because they don't have to, this is the reasons why not all companies with five or more employees do have a works council, because not all employees think this is a helpful thing. If they so decide, they vote and erect a, a works council. But in all this kind of, on the works council side, there are no guaranteed union seats. Unions are only represented in works councils in the coincidence that employees are union members at the same time and then represent as workers, they go to the works council, not as union members. In reality, many times, the workers are union members in the banking sector, at least. But not, we have three unions in Germany in the banking field, and it's not always the largest union that gets the most votes in the works council election and vice versa. So it's a very diverse picture, and you also have a lot of people that are not unionized on works councils because, as voters are, they do not judge by some kind of label that people put on themselves, but they judge what do they think the person as a personality can bring for, for workers' rights. And so it is really a diverse picture that you have um, that you have in the field. So this participation in workplace-related issue goes in different ways of um, of co-determination, if you're so like. Co-determination is the strongest right the Works Council has, but it also has a lot of rights that are merely information rights, and it has a lot of rights that are collaborative rights, where it is not a real co-determination, meaning the decision can only be made if employer and works council agree. This is what we call co-determination. And if they don't agree, there is a conciliation procedure, and it, this is not in front of a court, but in front of a separate body. And the reason is co-determination takes place not in the area of a legal question, that always goes to the court, but it takes place in the area of how do we want to do it, which is not a legal question, but a, an operative question. And so you need a board that reconciles it, that it's not coming from a legal side, but more from an operative side. Practically, most of the time, the neutral person in these conciliation bodies is a labor judge. But 
this labor judge comes into this conciliation board by agreement of employer and employee side. And if they cannot agree, the labor court appoints one. So this is the procedure how co-determination issues are solved if the parties cannot agree. And most of the time when you have a judge in front of you and you negotiate with the works council or with the employer, at the end of the day then you do agree and he or she as judge does not have to render a decision because they are usually convincing enough that people can agree. Because at the end of the day, it has to be lived by both parties in the enterprise. And this is why you do not really want a decision. You want to take the responsibility because you have to t have the responsibility of making this agreement operative in the end. And what are the areas of, uh, of co-determination? Well, for it really goes from hiring to termination throughout the lifespan of an employment relationship. So, in Germany, when an employee is hired, the, the Works Council will look on the fact whether the right wage group is selected, um, whether the employee has the, has the appropriate um, knowledge to do the job, whether the employee is not a burden to those employees who are already there, and so, it's just, so he, he co-decides um, in the sense of whether a person is em employed or not. But the core issues of co-determination, they have to do with the running of the employment relationship. So, for example, all collective issues, not single employment issues between em single employee and employer, where a works council is usually not competent, but where it goes about collective questions. This is where you have an ongoing debate and a co-determination right of works councils. For example, what is the working time system of an enterprise, the works council is there to find a common solution with the employer. When it comes to overtime, the works council has a co-determination right. When it comes to basic um, and general provisions on how vacation is taken, what employees get a priority, for example, in with school children in times of uh, school vacation and things like this. The Works Council has a co-determination right. When it comes to the question of new technologies and their way into the enterprise, including all updating of software, Works Council has a co-determination right. When it comes to the question how are wages paid, not what amount of wages are paid, but how are they paid. Works Council has a co-determination right. So you can see it is a, the areas are, are vast and very extensive. When it comes to the termination of the employment relationship, maybe this is interesting as well. The Works Council does not have a co-determination right, but it has a right to be heard. It's a collaboration right. It also has the right to make interventions and to, to bring forward their opinion. But at the end of the day, if the employer wants to terminate the employment relationship, he or she can do so, even if the Works Council objects. Sometimes there are collective bargaining agreements between unions and Works Councils <coughs> that limit this right to termination, but a Works Council with the employer cannot limit the right to termination. Bringing up this as aspect, it is important to understand that there is a strict division between competences of works councils and competences of unions. And why is that so? It is so because the works councils, as I have told you, they do not settle legal questions with the employers. This do courts. And they are not competent under German law to negotiate wages. Why is this? The reason for this is the Works Council is limited to an enterprise. Under German law, you cannot be a union if you are limited to one enterprise only. There are only public sector exceptions that I will not go into. In the private sector, a union that is competent for collective bargaining always has to be a multi-employer union. What is the rationale behind it? The rationale behind it is, under German law, the employer must not be able to have an influence on how many people are in a union. 
if the employer has the right to terminate relationships, he employment relationship, he has an influence on how strong the union is. And this is why unions under German law with a capacity to negotiate collective agreement have to be multi-employer. So works houses are never this, so they cannot bargain collectively for wages. Also, in statutes where you can find different solutions and go away, for example, from working time, extend the time span where you have where you have the right as an employer to make overtime and then give it back as free time. This can be negotiated with the union, but it cannot be negotiated with the works council. The reason is the right to strike is attached to a union. Unlike in Italy, it does not rest with the individual employee. The employee has no right to strike under German law if not the union says we go on to it, we go to a strike. So this is a very big difference. It's a collective right, and the works council, since the works council from the outset is is a body where at the end of the day you have reconciliation. This, under German understanding, you cannot have in labor conflict issues like collective bargaining. There is no mandatory conciliation. The parties can refer to if they want to, but from a statutory point of view, there has to be the right of strike and lockout, real conflict, and this has to be guaranteed. And it is guaranteed by our constitution that the collective bargaining parties we as the employer organization, the unions as our social partners do have these rights. Works councils do not, and this is why they cannot negotiate on wages, about wages with the employer. Now, in order to sum it up, one more involvement of the works councils, not a code of determination right, comes when the organigram is changed, for example, also in the um, context of changes of the enterprise. <laughs> there, the, um, before any changes so the organigram of the enterprise is made by the employer. For example, he decides to close a branch. He decides to give tasks to another person, which changes the organigram. The employer has to involve the works council, talk with the works councils about the plans before they are finalized. And then after consulting the works council, the employer can do whatever he or she likes, but they have to talk to the works council before. And, of course, usually in the way how banks are run, this is then taken into consideration. Usually, if these are very strategic measures, and this is why I have explained to you before the code determination on the board level, this has been gone to the board representatives who were already there, and now this is broken down on the works council level on the other side of the code determination procedures that you have. So, you need a little more time in order to involve everyone, but it's a practice that everyone is used to, and this is how it's handled. And maybe for an outlook to see where new legal situations and new market situations have an effect on these rights are, for example, and we had the great example of Unicredito a moment ago and early in the morning, is what happens when the decisions are no longer made at the local level, but are made at a group level. Even more important if the group is outside the borders of Germany, because like every law in every world, co-determination ends at the German border. So, if the decisions are taken outside Germany, then there is of course the problem that also the employer representative, if he or she does not have a decision power, there is no link to a co-determination procedure. And maybe you can imagine that this is something that not only employer rep 
representatives do not like very much, but also <laughs> works councils, unions, and labor courts do not like it because it is a way around the co-determination procedures that are established in Germany. So, what needed to be done in the eyes and minds of the federal labor court judges were to see that the co-determination then can find a way to attach to a lower level. So, for example, if the mother group is in, the, is in another country, decisions are made and rendered into Germany and then have to be in some way executed, where this execution takes place, the Works Council has to be involved. The issue is, of course, depending on is there a decision leeway for the employer where the Works Council has a right to negotiate. The issue is, of course, the lower and the more narrow this leeway and decision-making power is on the national level, the more narrow the scope is of the core determination right. So this is, for example, one of the issues that we will have that more and more internationalization will bring into the German market, where not unions but also employers see, I would not see dangers, but challenges to the established model that we are all used to in, in, in dealing with one another. So, this is, I think, important to understand where the internationalization comes in. Now, how does European Works Councils relate to this kind of Works Council procedure that I have just described to you? Not only legally, but also from the way these councils are working, it's a very distinct method, of course, as you can imagine from what I have told you. Because most of the um, most of the dealings between employer and employee on the works council, in the works council area, are determined by law and not by agreement that is usually the basis for a European works council. Also, you can see that the rights a works council has compared to European works councils go beyond consultation in very many issues there. Uh, uh, made as true co-determination rights where without the consent of the Works Council, the employer has to take another loop through this conciliation uh, body that has to be established for these kinds of things. <coughs> and also it is, it is a bottom-up process. I think this is also important to understand because under German law, if you think about a branch in a bank, the enterprise and the group, the co-determination right usually is at the branch level. And only if things cannot be managed at the branch level, the next higher enterprise level or the next higher group level is competent. So what does this mean? Unlike 10 years ago where we had a legislation that the employer can choose with which body to negotiate by saying, I want this working times regime, for example, to be group-wide, then he was talking with the Works Council on the group level. <laughs> Today, the courts say we no longer oppose this. If it is possible to do it at the branch level, you have to do it at the branch level. This, of course, brings other challenges because it could be that branch in city A has this working time regime, branch in city B has this one, branch in city C has this one, depending on the kind of works councils, depending on the types of interests that are around. This is bring, can also bring some competition between these systems, of course. So whether this is really a good development or not, we will see. It's fairly new and we all are in the process of finding out whether it is really helpful or not, but this is how it is now. So this has changed and you understand that when you have a, you have a system where under the European directive you have a very um, 
high up um, information and consultation procedure complemented by one that is a very bottom up procedure that at some point you will have an issue. <coughs> because very obviously with everyone knowledgeable of how these things function in reality, people having their head up high overlooking a group sometimes can see more trees than those who are further down looking into a forest. It's just by nature. This brings a lot of discussions, not only on the employer side within the employer side, but also on the union and worker side within the worker side, because different interests simply come up in this kind of a setting. And it is interesting also for us to see where these co-determination rights are really strong in our way of day-to-day -day business, unlike what happens at the European Works Council, which has to be broken down. And, and it might, as we have just heard, take some time until it is there. Usually, the local Works Council already has to solve these kinds of questions before they arise there. So it is difficult in such a setting to understand who is to involve at what point in time, because it might be a limited issue. You are obliged by law to start with a limited branch, discussing it, and at the same time, it might be something that has a group-wide effect where you would consult a group body or even a European Works Council when it is a cross-border thing. So also, for the employer side, a multi-dimensional questions that come up simply by the way how they are handled and not always easy to trigger the right partner to talk to from the outset when you at the moment where you are acting do not know how this might be developing so summing up it is um, the the european works council when it came into being from a german perspective was nothing really new. We were used to involve works councils um, in, in decisions of more crucial effect, let me say, than what the directive has said. So for those companies that, that come from a German co-determination history, um, it was more or less uh, having another layer in addition to the group level that was new when transnational issues were discussed. But from a German perspective, usually on the group works council that has already been in place, these were exactly the issues that you discussed before. So it was really not something new from the, from the way that things were discussed with the employees. From a German perspective, it was an additional and what we then sometimes feel um, an additional layer without a lot of, um, at, at the outset, without a lot of convincing new ideas coming to the employer side. This, of course, has changed in the meantime because uh, the, um, uh, the, e uh, the European Works Councils, unlike the Group Works Council under German law, is, of course, an international council, which then helps also from the employer side, as we have heard a minute ago, by the presentation of Monica, to get, to get an idea of what is happening in the group from an uh, employee perspective, which is, of course, important for us uh, to know. And this we did not have in the Group Works Council before. So it really came and proved as an additional uh, path of information also for the employer. And then it depended a lot, of course, on the agreement of, that was made to erect and to establish the European Works Council. With this, Mario, I would close and, uh, of course, give you the opportunity for questions because I know that I can only give you an, an overview, but I'm ready to, uh, to talk about the details uh, if you like. Thank you very much. <laughs> for putting it down to the point. That's, I like it, and that's good that you do it. First, um, for the supervisory board um, that, that you have said, that why, why was that not prevented? 
And you you posed a question to a discussion that in, in the German system is now taking a very, very prominent role. The Deutsche Hans Böckler Stiftung, which is a, which is a, is a union um, which comes from the union in this making training for employee supervisory board members very good. And I have to admit, when I have a question, I myself am on the supervisory board, not uh, in, in banks, in, in the chemical industry. When I have a question, I refer to them because they are really good. It's, it's a very fundamental and, and, and very, very good um, training these people get. The reason is, because of that liability and because of the distinct um, um, tasks that supervisory board and executive board has, Ma many things that you were referring to of Volkswagen um, and sometimes also banks, of course the executive board will not tell the supervisory board. With the supervisory board you have shareholder representatives, they are elected by shareholders or workers, uh, and of course the, the supervision, uh, the, the most important right the executive board has is the right is the obligation to information of the supervisory board. But as you know, as a, as a worker representative, the right to information is only as good as the information is not too much, not too little, precisely tailored and uh, made in a way that is understandable for those who get this information. And we are now trying to find out how this can happen in dual system because the supervisory board in these situations, of course, is under fire because to understand where was the question, why didn't they find out, why didn't they ask the right uh, questions in order to find out if the information was not given freely by the executive board. So this is a valid point. We add it, but the solution, I think, is a little bit far away. What we try in most is um, training for those who are there, also for the capital side. Um, but this is how we try to solve these issues and prevent exactly these kinds of things with EWC, um, from a, uh, to whether agreements can be mo modified. I think this relates to the question you have. When you want to co-decide on any, in any group, in any committee, this brings about a responsibility. It is m more than being opposed, it is being within the decision. The difficulties have just been addressed by our Spanish colleagues and um, it is not, you have in, 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 in other European countries, you have traditions where the involvement of employees in these kinds of decision making process are also not wanted by employees because they say we are on the employee side, we do not want to be on the employer side, it's their decision, I do not want to be a part of the decision. And I think within Europe, it is important to, to understand these different kinds of cultures. What for me, from a German perspective, is the most natural thing to do, because I think responsibility comes with a right to decision-making, but with a right to decision-making also comes responsibility on the other side. For other countries, I know with my talks, for example, in, in, in some of the French unions, they would completely reject this notion and say, this is not my role, and I don't want this. And now if you are talking about the European Works Council comprised of all these different uh, cultures, I think it is really a difficult thing to say, um, looking, at this, uh, looking at this committee, is more co-determined or, or even rights in the direction of co-determination right. Is this a future or will this deter people from getting involved? on a European level. And I think we are still in the way, in the process of finding it out, but I think this is why we look at different kinds of agreement, also in, by of these works councils, these European work councils, how the, how the rights are established uh, differently. And probably this is, this is the way, I think it is a fairly, if you see 1994, 1996, it's quarter of a century is, is a long time on the one hand, on the other hand, it's not a long time to change a tradition of involvement. And uh, I think, of course, we, we will be moving in, in the direction, but we have to make it attractive in the sense, because as we all know, there are still 
enterprises opting out of this model by choosing a, uh, the European um, government, uh, the European uh, corporate form, because they can negotiate more freely away from a German system of co-determination inside the. So this should tell us something when when we look at the system. Where where are detriments that people do not want? You know, in order to keep it attractive for the future. And I think this is also what should be done when, when we talk about um, agreements to erect European Works Council, that we find a good balance, that we can include all the different traditions that we have, but also attach the right responsibility to the decisions that are made. So my outlook would be a, a positive one in the sense that I think we can do more, but I think it really depends on the culture also of the enterprise where it is made.